still hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you all hear? Yeah. Well, here I am, my Sunday best suit with all my medals, oh, and I got my American Academy of Arts and Sciences and uh, Commander of Arts and Letters for the French. And there's a reason for that, because I had to go to the embassy today to, day to get my passport renewed. Well, in the old days, you really came in contact with the fucking council, and if you didn't like your looks, it was pretty bad. Uh, now it's all done through a um, barrier of bulletproof glass. <laughs> And it's all very impersonal, very simple, so I need to change my clothes at talk. But, um... It's probably uh, just as well that I didn't uh, contact the consul directly because uh, my suit carrier had been in the closet and my cat's got in there and sprayed and pissed all over it, which permeated all my clothes. So when I got to Paris, they all reeked of cat piss. And, um, that wouldn't have been good, but, uh, no, but I think a Roma should be say, a soup song of cat piss is, uh, quite appropriate for someone who has just written a cat book called The Cat Inside. <laughs> well, actually, I'm a militant animal activist. I would see a street of human remains, the walking dead, literally counterfeit human stock destroyed to save one Kaluga, the incomparable Gliding lemur. Lemurs are such beautiful creatures anyway. Uh, and they're in the rainforest of Barneo. And what I would rather see destroy than one of my cats would be very disquieting if I had the means to implement it. <laughs> well, they're making way for counterfeit human stock. It's just like, uh, okay, you got a dollar, it's supposed to um, represent that much in gold. Uh, and if it, uh, if it doesn't represent that, see everybody suddenly says, where is our gold? Now what is the equivalent with humans? It's energy, energy, and so if they issue all this uh, human stock with no sec energy behind it, it's going to come a time when everybody says, where is our gold, where is our life? And there isn't any life. Well, I'll be reading now from the cat inside. This book is about interspecies contact, not interspecies communication. There is a basic difference between communication and contact. Communication is designed to avoid contact, to establish a distance across which communication can take place. Contact involves identification with the creature you contact, and this can be very painful. Communication can be forced. It happens in every precinct. <coughs> you know, to talk, you're not going to be on condition to talk one or the other. Uh, contact cannot. You cannot force anyone to feel. This modest cutbook recounts my own experiences with interspecies contact. Well, you know when it happens. Can't be faked. 
Now, there were there are about 30 species of cats, and some of them about three pounds in weight at maturity. Ah, uh, imagine that. About the size of a three-month-old kitten. Uh, the um, rusty spotted cat can be easily tamed as kittens. Plaintive lost spirits waiting for the human hand that will never come further and further away. Um, the rainforests of Borneo and South America are going to make way for what? A Los Alamos ranch school where they later made the animal bomb and couldn't wait to drop it on the yellow peril. Uh, the boys are sitting on logs and rocks eating some sort of food. Uh, there's a stream at the end of a slope. The counselor was a southerner with a politician look about him. Like many southerners, he was a natural order. Just naturally full of bullshit. He told us stories by the campfires, cool from the racist garbage of the insidious sex rumor. A uh, sex rumor who created the insidious Dr. Fu Manchu, Hirsch Yellow Pearl. And he went on to, uh, yeah, well, Fu Manchu went on and on. They thought they killed him. They had uh, he also wrote books about evil Egyptians, the unspeakable Anthony Ferrara. I think that's a breed of pasta. <clears throat> yes, exactly. Well, Tony looked more like a beautiful evil woman than a man, up to his crotch in unspeakable practices and rights and secrets so foul no decent man may learn them and live. I wonder if, decent, if indecent people may be able to survive. Uh, the basic postulate, East is cruel, depraved, devious, immoral, anti-Christ, anti-American, and the word evil. West is humane, decent, wholesome, straightforward, moral, sincere, and God-fearing, and in the word, good. Well, good for what exactly? <clears throat> uh, suddenly a badger erupts among the boys. Don't know why he did it. Does playful, friendly, and inexperienced like the Indians who brought fruit down to the Spanish and got their hands cut off. So the council rushes for his saddlebag and gets out his uh, 1911 Colt 45 auto and starts blasting at the badger, missing it with every shot at six feet. <laughs> Finally, he puts his gun three inches from the badger's side and shoots. This time, the badger falls down the slope into the stream, rolls down the slope into the stream. I can see the stricken animal, the, sh the sad, shrinking face, Rolling down the slope, bleeding and dying. You see an owl when you kill it, don't you? It might have bitten one of the boys. You know, I can feel... Um, I can feel the badger right now. And um, boy, I can feel my hatred for that son of a bitch. And everyone like him. I want to straighten out a point. I'm a gun collector, but I don't hunt. I would never kill a deer. And I would never kill a squirrel. They're too much like cats. My guns are for people like him. <clears throat> I don't know how many of you saw the uh, TV shirt on Bigfoot tracks and sightings in the Northwest Mountain areas. Interviews with local inhabitants. Here is a 300-pound uh, female slob. And uh, 
she says, they ask her, what is your opinion? What in your opinion should be done about these creatures if they exist? The dark shadow crosses her ugly face and her eyes shine with conviction. Kill them, they might hurt somebody. As a specimen of homo sap on screen, got a long range rifle with telescopic sights. Close cropped beard tries to look like an adventurer and looking like a marginal freelance journalist who writes for Survival Magazine. He is quite sure. Big Peter out there in those hills and proposes to kill a specimen. If I lived in the area, of course, I'd be more worried about this jerk with his long-range rifle than about Bigfoot. Um, well, as uh, the camera camera team uh, just happens on Bigfoot with their cameras, and uh, there he is, about 300 yards away, walking with a strange, slow gait, uh, like a moonwalk. Scientific stride experts say this is not a human stride, certainly not at 24 frames per second. I suspect it to be a man in a gorilla suit projected in slow motion. <clears throat> very, very definitely. <clears throat> An English cat hater of the upper classes, he became a lord in the course of time, I hear. Well, this limey son of a bitch confided in me and trained a dog to break a cat's back with one shake. And I remember he caught sight of a cat at a party and snarled out from his long yellow horse teeth that crowded out of his mouth, nasty, stinking little beast. <coughs> I will take this occasion to denounce and execrate the vile English practice of riding to hounds, so the sodden huntsman can watch a beautiful, delicate fox torn to pieces by their stinking dogs. Heartened by this loudish spectacle, they repair to the manor house to get drunker than they already are. No better than their filthy, fawning, shit-eating, carrion rolling baby-killing beasts. If you are expecting, any young couple is expecting a blessed event, get rid of that family dog. What? Our fluffy harm a child? Well, that's ridiculous. Long may your child live to think so, little mother. Fondly dandling their child and drooling baby talk when Fluffy in a jealous rage rushes on the baby, bites through a skull, and kills it. <laughs> this is a, there's a number of cases. It's like leaving an icebox out, you know. Uh, dogs are the only animal other than man with knowledge of right and wrong. So Fluffy knows what to expect when he is dragged whimpering from under the bed where he cowers. No other animal would wake, would make the connection. <clears throat> um, a panther snarl is much more dangerous than a dog snarl, but isn't it ugly? A dog snarl is ugly because it isn't his. It isn't his rage. Uh, this is from, um, some idea of time here. Yeah. This is from a uh, novel in progress, uh, The Western Lands. Joe the Dead belongs to a select breed of outlaws known as the Nose, natural outlaws dedicated to breaking the so-called laws of nature. Uh, foisted on us by physicists, chemists, mathematicians, biologists, and above all, the monumental fraud of cause and effect to be replaced by the more pregnant concept of synchronicity. 
Ordinary outlaws break man-made laws. Laws against theft and murder are broken every second. You only break a natural law once. The ordinary criminal breaking a law is a means to an end. Uh, to the no, breaking a natural law is an end, the end of that law. <laughs> now, ordinary outlaws uh, specialize in accordance with inclination and aptitude. Are they dead? Many of them are on the endangered species list with a gliding lemur the rusty spotted cat, and the monkey-eating eagle, who will not be missed by the monkeys. Uh, consider the Murphy Man. How many of you know what a Murphy Man is? I'd be very surprised if one hand went up. <laughs> a piece of American folklore. But these old scams are basically universal. Well, the Murphy man uh, steers the mark to a horn. Well, um, so what distinguishes a Murphy man from a pimp? Well, the Murphy man explains it. A pimp got whores what is, I got whores what ain't. Ain't whores, ain't nothing except maybe a charge of attempted rape on some housewife. <clears throat> Your Murphy man steers the mark to a non-existent whore, having located an apartment building without a doorman and with a front door open. It's mostly a black guard. Boy, they got the Murphy man voice cool, insinuating, familiar in the Murphy man's face. Sincere, untrustworthy. He spots a mark away from the wife and kids for a night on the town. Looking for some action, friend? Oh, well, yes, you can. Cautious and timid. That's the way he likes them. The Murphy man makes a phone call. It's all set up. He leaves the mark to the apartment entrance. Go up one flight first door on your left. Prime grade friend, and she's ready and waiting on you. You pay me off so there won't be any arguments. I wonder if there are any Murphy men left. And practitioners, the height of the bill. This was a short change routine. You start with $20, get the change on the counter. That I, well, I don't want to take all your change. Give me ten. Well, he gets the ten, he gets the twenty back in his pocket and counts it back, of course, minus the twenty. It's hard to get a conviction because nobody can explain exactly what happened. I've had it explained to me many times and I still have, don't have it straight. That's the whole point of the goddamn thing. The basic principle can be found in a sketch by Edgar Allan Poe on 19th century hustlers who were known as Didders. Well, Didder walks into a tobacco store and asks for a plug of tobacco. When the plug is on the counter, he changes his mind. Uh, give me a cigar instead. He takes the cigar and starts to walk out. Wait a minute. You didn't pay me for the cigar. Of course not. I traded against the tobacco plug. Well, I don't recall you paid me for that either. Paid you for it? Why, there it is. None of your tricks on traveling, man. There's a neat little double bind in there. We'll take the guy, and he'll be able to get around the corner before the guy figures it out. <laughs> well, um... Most of the uh, practitioners of the hype were addicts. Uh, I wonder if there are any hype men left. The yellow kid wild in a big store. He would set up a whole brokerage office, a bookmaking parlor. He was the one who said nobody can treat an honest man. And he always kept uh, the market at justice. Never drink with a savage is one of his models. 
the old time bank robbers, the burglars who bought jewelry insurance, this and knew what they were looking for. Uh, where are they now? The Murphy Man, the hype artist, the big store, gone, oh, gone. Où sont les neiges d'Anton? Ordinary outlaws specialize, and so do the nose. Uh, Joe the Dead specializes in evolutionary biology. He dedicates his dearly bought knowledge of pain and death to cracking two biologic laws. Rule one, hybrids are permitted only between closely related species and then grudgingly. And the few existing hybrids must be forever sterile. In fact, the falling mule is one of the more horrific portents of disaster. Uh, the biologic police bluntly warned to break down the lines that Mother Nature and her ripe wisdom, ripe is right, I can smell it from here, has established between species is to invite biologic and social chaos. Joe says, what do you think I'm doing here? Let it come down. Rule two, an, evolu an evolutionary step that involves biologic mutation is irretrievable and irreversible. Newts start life in the water with gills. At the determined time, the newt sheds his gills and crawls upon the ordained land, now equipped with air-breathing lungs. The newt then returns to the water where he lives out his days. Now, it might be convenient to reclaim his gills and breathe uh, underwater again. No glut from Friday, says the cosmic uncle, it's the law. So for starters, to get rule one, Joe pulls a baby mule out of the cosmic manger. There is Mary, mother mule, and John, the father, and the impossible child with a glowing, pulsing halo. Incidentally, the fact that John was a part-time veterinarian might, should we say, illuminate the virgin birth. Still, the virgin birth, after all, a sterile syringe is not a corrupt and impure member. A Kansas vet known as Joel Lazarus after he was pronounced dead at Lawrence Memorial Hospital, having kicked him ahead by a mule, was the instrument of altered destiny. Like St. Paul knocked off his ass on his way to Damascus, Joe Laz, following his miraculous recovery, knew what he had to do. He set out to produce a fertile mule. He exposed sperm from his horses and donkeys to argon radiation in the magnetized pyramid. Didn't hack it. So Laz went further. He rigged a magnetized manger and bombarded the copulating animals with D.O.R. deadly organ radiation. He stowed himself into a goat skin and whipped his beast to wild pan music. Any woman hit by the whip of the goat god will conceive in nine months. And finally he created a fertile mule. Skeptics pronounce Joe Laz as mule the most colossal hoax since the virgin birth. I had it up my sleeve, Joe deadpan. A quiet and enigmatic former herpetologist residing in Florida challenges rule two. His name is Joe Sanford. Bitten by a king cobra, he recovered and devoted himself to a study of newts and salamanders. Sanford claims to have reinstated gills in mature air-breathing newts by injections of a lamb percenta concentrate. The same preparation, in fact, used by Dr. Niehaus, Niehaus of Geneva. 
to turn back the clock for his wealthy patients, to name a few, Somerset Maugham, Noel Coward, Pope Pius XIII, President Eisenhower, I remember Eisenhower waving our little pink flag from his hospital bed on, Jesus, will you ever die? <laughs> Winston Churchill couldn't qualify since he couldn't lay off the South for six weeks, uh, which was a um, prerequisite of the treatment. Uh, you would know the rule, too, carries the implicit assumption that time is a one-way street is irreversible. Sandra makes a hole in time and Joe sloshes through the high breads. All is in the not done, the diffidence that altered. Let others quaver out, I dare do all that may become a man, who dares do more is none. Not so, says Joe, he who dares at all must dare all. When mules foes, anything goes. When mules glows, anything foes. Hybrids Unlimited. Who? 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 It was not necessary to prove uh, anything, simply to state. Uh, this is a biologic revolution fought with new species and new ways of thinking and feeling. A war where the bullet may take millenniums to hit, like the old joke about someone who makes a swipe with a razor. Well, miss me that time. Just try and shake your head 500 years from now. <clears throat> Dead Souls. This is a film idea loosely suggested by a sci-fi book called Lost Souls. A uh, dead soul postulates that a soul is an electromagnetic field designed to occupy and activate a certain organism. While infinitely less vulnerable than the artifact it occupies, the soul can be dispersed and destroyed by a nuclear blast. This is, in fact, the sensitive function of the atom bomb, a soul killer. Stacked up, you understand, like cordwood and non-recyclable by the old hellfire like fucking plastics. We have to stay out of ourselves and the islands, lest some joker endanger our national security by bringing out you have souls. You can survive your physical death. Ruins of Hiroshima on screen pull back to show technician of the switchboard. Behind him, three middle-aged men in dark suits with a cold, dead look of heavy power. The technician twiddles his knobs. All clear. Are you sure? Technician shrugs. The instruments say so. Opie says, thank God it wasn't a dud. Oh, uh, hurry up with those printouts, Joe. Yes, sir, he looks at them sourly. Thank Joe it wasn't a dud. God doesn't know what buttons are push or what happens when you push them. Well, how are some tough old souls, uh, horribly maimed and very disgruntled? Do survive Hiroshima and come back to cause a lot of trouble. So the scientists are put to work to devise a super soul killer. No job too dirty for a fucking scientist. <clears throat> Why, they don't do anything. Uh, there are some laboratory accidents. Run for your lives, gentlemen, a purple-ass baboon. I survived 22 skidoo. It's the most savage animal on earth. The incandescent baboon soul rips through a steel door like wet paper. Well, we had to vaporize the installation, lost expensive equipment and personnel, irreplaceable, some of them real soul food chefs, cordon blur, you might say. There's an interesting detail from the book. 
The soul killer gives off a smell of burning plastic and rotten oranges. Anything so bizarrely arbitrary is good enough to steal, I think. <clears throat> uh, well, we now have soul killers that don't quit. Stay to the part. Sure, the big part. We know how it's all going to end. The first sound, the last sound. Meanwhile, all personnel on planet Earth confined to quarters, permanent party, you might say. Convince them they have no souls. It's more humane that way. A uh, scientist always said there's no such thing as a soul, and they are now in a position to prove it. Total death, soul death. That's what the Egyptians call the second and final death. This awesome power to destroy souls forever is now vested in the... What'd you bring this old beast in here for? A withered old man dressed only in a loincloth stiff with yellow piss stains, stinking like a snake cave in spring, sits down on a leather armchair. Fumigating the chair will be inadequate, the colonel decides. He's a natural chief. He can throw an operative curse. I don't doubt it. he can kill by proximity. He's got a good track record, Chief. Sure, sure. And 80 years in the making. So how do you get the way? To be a magician, you got to be inhuman in some way. Easiest is to eat your own shit and eat it steady. You eat it in and shit it out and eat it in again. It gets either and dirtier or stink nobody can smell and live. But who am I to be critical? <clears throat> Trouble is, it just isn't practical. But she no trace. No way it can be traced to us. The hell there isn't. You think the islands aren't into this shit up to their ass. They can make up the evidence we all do it. No way to trace it. Big deal. Eighty shit-eating years to turn out one old human centipede you can throw a curse if you hold him steady on target. I can train an agent in hours with untraceable poisons and toxins, electronic devices to produce irrhythmical heartbeats. He died in his sleep, dreaming about a beautiful, dead, deadly woman. And all he wanted to do was die in her arms, and he did. Uh, see what I mean? We don't need it. But, Chief, we can't just throw away a thing like this. Indeed, where can we throw it? It's radioactive. Get it out of here, for starters, and take the chair out with it. <clears throat> The medical rights of 1999 is estimated that 10,000 doctors, medical bureaucrats, and directors of pharmaceutical companies were massacred in the week of the long scaffolds. The killings were not by any means random. The rioters had lists. They're the bastard. Let me pass a kidney stone in the emergency room. It stacked up and up unnecessary operations. Patients die in the emergency room. We can't accept medical omissions from emergency. Potentially beneficial and harmless products and treatments kept off the market like rikes. Organ accumulators, lethal products kept on the market. A recent example are the uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs for arthritis. Don't let any doctor talk you into taking no drugs. Um, in England, eight people died of liver failure caused by the drug, and they won't take it off the market. It's changed the trade name and go on selling it. I uh, saw a TV show 
where the company representative, you can just see the light ooze and slithering out of him, tries to tell a woman her hepatitis could have been caused by something else. She said, I know it was that medicine. It was a bird unit walkout set it up. Now I have this from nurses who have worked in burn units. Absolutely no morphine or other painkiller is ordered for the patients. Other, otherwise, there could be danger of addiction for patients who may be under treatment for months. Even the dying are denied morphine if they have the misfortune to die in the burn unit. But doctor, my nurse informant protests, the patient will be dead in 12 hours. Don't you think I know that? This is the burn unit. We are under burn unit rules. Really. Hands are securely tied by 200,000 a year. Every day, burn unit patients have the raw cavity scrubbed out with a stiff brush to clean away dead skin and flesh. And the patients scream with agony. Very few nurses can take it or work in the burn unit. A team of amateur astronauts who call themselves the spacers landed in the burn unit when their homemade space rocket exploded, uh, spattering them with burning rocket fuel. Uh, after the first scrub, they issued an ultimatum. Morphine every four hours or we walk out. What is this nonsense? There will be no morphine. You're not going anywhere. Meet my brother, the lawyer, doctor. You propose to hold these people against their will? It's for their own good. If they leave the hospital, they will be dead in a few days from infection. Uh, well, they set up a private clinic in the loft, clashed with police, raiders searching for narcotics, three patients shot to death. The walkout spreads like a topping forest fire morphine in a walk. Mo, mo, mo. The doctors paw the ground uneasily like cattle scenting danger. In 17th century London, everybody got fed up with the lawyers, and the cry went up, Kill all the bloody lawyers! Quote from a chronicler, Whereupon even the most elderly and infirm scrambled off of their jelly of rats or evil spirits. <laughs> Hampered by an inflated self-image, the healers did not equip themselves as well. What are we waiting for? A hospital bed? Kill all the fucking croakers. Security steps nimbly aside and the crowd rushes in. Got a hot shot cutting doc here. I think he needs an operation. Hell yes, I got ectomy. Paging Dr. Friedenhof and Dr. Streulenschnitt, Dr. Cemetery and Dr. Slappycut, and are attended by their scapel bearers with three foot saws of scapels. <clears throat> you is filled up with unnecessitated parts. Two kidney sharp on as a Jew Rashmet. The inside parts need leavens around like the butterland. Egyptians took to Christianity like a vulture takes to carrion. The resurrection of the 
body. That's what mummies are all about. I think the Christian God exists. His fingerprints and ammo are abundantly obvious. Recollect Pope John 23 saying, Like a little soldier, I stand at attention in the presence of my captain. The old army gang from here to eternity get their purses with the brown as nose. Look at this one and only. He's all-powerful and all-knowing. He can't learn anything since he knows everything already. He can't go any place because he is already every place. A one-god universe is inexorably thermodynamic, having no friction by definition. So he must provoke friction uh, riots, wars, pain, fear, hate, and death to keep his dying show on the road. And it takes more and more friction to produce less and less energy. Sec, we call it in the trade. Now, as Joe explains it, look, from a real to the last, you get a Big of sex, sacrifice, heroism, grief, separation, fear, and above all, violent death. Remember that one violent death yields more sex than a cancer ward. Life in all its rich variety. So from a sex surplus, you can underwrite the next. But if the first one is a fake, you can't underwrite a shithouse. Try and tell God Almighty where his one God universe is going. Asshole doesn't know what buttons to push or what happens when you push them. Abandon ship God damn it, every man for himself. Can't launch a lifeboat ball, Spilm's fuck. Fix it. What with a band-aid and chewing gum? Leaking the master film. Fix it yourself, master. Uh, Ken believes in the magical universe. Unpredictable, spontaneous, alive. A universe where anything is possible. A universe of many gods often in conflict. So the paradox of an all-powerful, all-knowing God, who nonetheless permits suffering, evil, and death, does not arise. What happened, Osiris? We got a famine here. Well, you can't win them all. I'm hustling myself. Can you give us immortality? Mm -hmm. I can give you an extension, maybe. Take you as far as the first checkpoint. You'll have to make it from there on your own. Most of them don't. Figure about one in a million. And biologically speaking, that's very good thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burroughs. Till next time, in Wapo. <laughs>